Uh, hi everyone, welcome to my dissertation defense. Uh, yeah, first, I would like to thank my advisor, Dr. Chen Chen, and my committee members, Dr. Mubak Shah, Dr. Li Chang Wan, and Dr. Min Jilin. So thank you for giving me the constructive feedbacks for improving my dissertation. <coughs> so my dissertation is about uh, towards efficient and effective representation for image and video understanding. Uh, let me first explain what's uh, representation learning, almost specifically what's deep representation learning. So like shown in this figure, deep representation learning is to use deep neural networks to learn uh, semantic meaningful features or representations from the raw data. And after the feature changing, we will get a bigger space that's more distinguishable as shown in this right figure. So uh, in computer vision, the common learning paradigm is that we first bridging a bamboo network on large scale data to learn good representations. And then we append those different uh, tasks head to the bamboo network to achieve different tasks. So we can see the representation learning is the first and fundamental step to achieve good performance on those downstream tasks. So to achieve, uh, to improve the representation learning, there are many two directions in the literature. <coughs> Um, one is to design new neural network architectures, and the other is to design new learning methods to, uh, to train the network better. Uh, so in the past 10 years, we've seen a fast evolution of the neural network architectures. So from the LXNet, uh, which is the first network to win ImageNet uh, challenge, and then we go to VGG and the ResNet, and then recent Vecchi structure. So those networks have uh, have achieved great success in computer vision, but they are also in large uh, model size. So to improve the efficiency, another line of works on uh, efficient networks are proposed, and researchers propose the uh, depth-wise uh, depth uh, separable convolution to reduce the complexity. And correspondingly, they propose the mobile net, sharp net, uh, efficient net, and et cetera, to improve the efficiency. <coughs> But there are still some limitations with those uh, efficient networks. That is, they are all standard. So that is, after training, they can only run at this specific model complexity. So here is the parameters and uh, flows of different networks. So, but, but in real applications, the resource budgets are always changing with many conditions. So, for example, on the mobile phone, if they, <coughs> the battery is highly made, we need be able to run the uh, resident safety. And when the uh, boundary is low, we may only be able to run the uh, mobile. So to meet this uh, dynamic resource budgets, we have to deploy multiple networks, which is inefficient and not scalable. Mm. To further improve the efficiency, we need adaptive networks. That is uh, one network that can run as different resource budgets. Uh, so this is for the network structure. And another direction to improve representation learning is to design a new learning method to train the network there. So one kind of method is a uh, visualization method, such as dropout. So in dropout, we randomly drop some neurons during training to alleviate the overfitting problem. And another kind of method is data augmentation, that is, uh, we augment the training data to increase the uh, data diversity to alleviate the overfitting problem. So although those methods have achieved uh, great success on uh, image classification, but uh, these improvements doesn't transfer uh, well to the downstream tasks such as uh, detection and segmentation. So we still need more robust and generalized representation learning method to achieve strong performance on various uh, tasks and data sets. So those are the uh, popular uh, representation learning methods before the era of foundation model. So recently we've seen the great success, uh, great success of foundation models in different areas. And in computer vision, there, there are also many uh, foundation models being proposed, for example, the clip model. But the, uh, the limitation is that those foundation models are very large, such as the largest Im image encoder in clip has more than 300 million parameters. And the model size is, is even larger in the uh, language domain. So, the largest GPT-3 model has uh, 175 billion parameters. So if we want to leverage those foundation models in our target downstream tasks, 
and we follow the traditional fine tuning method to tune them on the downstream paths. The computational cost would be very expensive. So to, uh, to efficiently leverage the foundation models, we need new efficient fine tuning method to adapt the foundation models to downstream paths. <coughs> So in this dissertation, we try to improve the efficiency and the effectiveness of representation learning by addressing the problems discussed above. So first, we propose a we propose an adaptive network where one network can run at different resource budgets for image and radio understanding, and then we propose the new regularization method to uh, to improve the robustness and the generalization ability of representation learning. And third, we propose a new method to adapt uh, image foundation models for uh, video understanding. And finally, I will talk about some future works. Okay, so in the first work, we propose adapting networks for image understanding. And this work has been accepted to ECCV. So let me further explain why we say traditional networks are standard. That is, they can only run at this specific uh, complexities during runtime. So during runtime, if we want to reduce the model complexity by reducing the network weight or input resolution. So here, reducing network weight means that we reduce the number of neurons or number of channels in each layer in the network as shown in this figure. So if we want to reduce the weight or resolution during, uh, during runtime, we can see the performance drops a lot. So for example, if we reduce the weights to 50%, the performance drops to 0.4. So basically the network is not working at all. But if we retrain this small network from scratch, we can actually achieve a good performance of uh, 63.3. And similarly, if we reduce the uh, input resolution, we can see the performance also drops a lot. So this means that we cannot uh, reduce the complexity of the network during one time. And to meet the dynamic resource budgets, we have to deploy multiple networks, which is inefficient and unscalable. So that's why we need a damping network. So there have been some previous works in exploring adaptive networks. So the works called slimmable networks, they propose to sample subnetworks by network ways during training, like in this figure, and they train those subnetworks together. And then after training, the network can run at different weights. But we point out that uh, the performance of cinemable networks drops a lot when the flows constraint goes to very low. Like here, when the flows goes to you know, 50, we can see the performance is uh, very low and it's not useful in real application. So to further improve the accuracy efficiency trade off, uh, we point out that the computational cost of a convolution layer is determined by uh, the number of channels times the kernel size and times the feature map size. So basically, we can think of the kernel size as phase, and then we can balance between the uh, network weights and the input resolution to achieve better accuracy efficiency trade offs. And also, we can change those different weights and resolution configurations together. And then we can learn multi scale representations for each sound network. And following this idea, uh, this is our training structure. So here is the training process of the regular network. So that is, we feed the image to the uh, full network and train using cross entropy. But as we discussed, after training, the network can only run at the specific resolution and using the full network. So to make this network adaptive, <laughs> uh, first, we randomly downsample the image into a different size. And here we randomly downsample the image into four different resolutions. And second, we also uh, randomly sample some sub networks from the full network by network weights. Uh, and here we are always sampling the smallest sub network. So the smallest sub network is basically the, uh, the lower bound of your model. It's basically how small you want your model to be. And here we are always sampling the smallest sum network and the full uh, and the full network because they are the uh, lower bound and upper bound of your model. So we want to optimize the lower bound and upper bound to optimize the uh, the overall performance of all sum networks. 
And besides the, uh, the small subnetwork and the full network, we are also sampling uh, two random subnetworks. And here we, we sampling by the uh, network weight. And, and also when we do the uh, sam sampling, we are always sampling the first part of the channels in each layer. So for example, if the, uh, if the full network has 100 channels, then when we say we sample a 50% subnetwork, we always sample the first 50 channels. And when we say we sample a 80% subnetwork, we always sample the first 80 channels. So, so in this way, a smaller subnetwork is always included in a larger subnetwork. And then after we get those different uh, input resolutions and different subnetworks, we just randomly uh, create those different uh, images into different subnetworks and we chain them together. So the loss is basically the full network loss plus the subnetwork loss. And then after training, our network can run at different resolution and different network weight. So that's the method. And here we give a uh, gradient analysis about the sub network during training. So here we consider a simple example. That's just two sub network, uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.8, and two resolutions, 128 and 192. So here, the first part is the gradient of the subnetwork 0.4, and the second part is the uh, uh, gradient of 0.8. So basically, we can split the gradient of 0.8 into two parts. That is the first 0.4 part and the second 0.4 part. And because we are always sampling the subnetwork by the first part of these uh, channels, so the first 0.4 part will have an overlap with the subnetwork 0.4. So in this way, the gradient of the subnetwork 0.4 is coming from two parts. Uh, one is coming from itself with a smaller resolution 128, and the other is coming from a, a larger subnetwork with a larger input resolution. So in this way, the subnetwork 0.4 can earn much scale uh, representations in terms of both network scale and input scale. So that's the whole training process. And then during inference, our objective is that given a resource budget, we want to find the best performed uh, model configuration. So to achieve this, we first uh, evaluate the performance of different uh, ways of resolution uh, on a validation set, and that's the first table. And in the second table, we also compute the uh, resource or the, the com computationally uh, complexity of different model configuration. And then basically our objective is that given a uh, complexity, we want to find the best performed configuration. And note that there are some com uh, complexity corresponds to multiple configurations. And for this case, we only keep the best performance. And uh, following this schedule, we can get a query table. And the query table is basically uh, given those different resource budgets, we have the best performed uh, model configuration. And then to, for deployment, we only de need to deploy one model and this uh, query table. And then we can adjust the model according to different resource, uh, resource budgets. So, so for example, if we have a res uh, resource budget of 200, and then we go to this table and we can say, when I run this uh, model, I'm uh, using 0 0.8 uh, weights and uh, one CST input resolution. So in this way, we can achieve adaptive networks. <clears throat> so that's the whole method. And here is the results on internet application. <laughs> so we can see our method largely outperforms USNet uh, in different flows. And specifically when the flows go to very low, we achieve a significant improvement of uh, 16.3. And similarly, our mobile v2 bamboo we also not only outperforms USNet. And here is the results on the individual training networks. So that's that is we follow the normal training process to train different model configurations individually. And those are the blue points in this data. So we can see our method still outperforms all the individually trained networks in different flows. And note that training those different networks individually is going to take much more training costs uh, compared to our method. 
And here in this case, the training cost would be seven times of our uh, of our model. So in for our model, we need to train once, and the model can run at different ways and input resolution. And here on mobile and retrieve, we also largely outperform the individual training network in different flows. And here is the transfer learning performance on total object detection and segmentation. And so similarly, we outperform uh, USNet uh, in both object detection and instant segmentation in different flows. Uh, and here are some visual examples of our method and USNet. So basically, we can say our method is more robust to extremely large objects and also extremely small objects compared to USNet. So this is is because of our model can learn much scale representations. Uh, so that's the first work where we propose adaptive networks for image understanding. And in the follow-up work, we also extend this work to video models to achieve uh, adaptive video understanding. And this work has been accepted to department. Uh, so let me first be, uh, introduce some uh, popular video models. So one uh, video structure is like this, a single branch structure. So this model, uh, video structure is basically the same as a 2D model. So basically it's just extend the 2D convolution into 3D convolution to handle the temporal dimension. So in this structure, the, the model is handling the spatial and temporal information symmetrically. And another kind of structure is like the, the slow pass, a two branch structure. So in this slow path structure, the slow branch is the main branch, and it has most of the model parameters, and it aims to learn the most frequent slow motion information. And the light, uh, the fast branch is the lightweight branch, and it aims to provide some complementary fast motion information to the slow branch. And then finally, we fuse those two branches to make the prediction. So in this structure, that kind of in this spatial and temporal information asymmetric. So we apply our method to those two uh, structures because they are two of the most popular video models. And when we apply our method to the single branch structure, it's actually pretty straightforward because the single branch structure is basically the same as the 2D model. Then for our method, we first randomly sample sub networks uh, by network weight. And for the input, we also randomly sample the input by uh, input, uh, sample the input resolution and also the number of frames. And then we fit different inputs to different networks and then train them together. And then the network can run at different weights and input resolution and number of frames. So uh, when applying to the multi-branch structure, there's some difference. Uh, <coughs> because we, we've seen that a fast branch is a lightweight branch and it aims to provide some complementary fast motion information. So if we do the sampling on fast branch, um, one thing that it's not going to reduce the computational cost a lot because it's already lightweight. And the other thing that when we do the sampling, we may lose those fast motion information and this will hurt the performance a lot. So for the slow fast network, we keep the fast branch unchanged and we only do the random sampling on the slow branch. So for the slow branch, it's basically the same as the single branch network. And then in this way, we can also achieve a damping network on the two branch structure. And that's the method. And here is the result on the kinetics for hungry. So here we can see, uh, so here we only compare to the individual neutrino networks because we are the first to achieve a damping radio model. And here we show that on both the single branch structure and the two branch structure, we outperform the individually trained networks in different flows. And also here we show that our model learns to balance the different dimensions to achieve better accuracy efficiency trade offs. So here the red line makes sense. The model is reducing the uh, input resolution to, re to reduce complexity. And the blue line is that the model is reducing number of frames to reduce complexity. And the uh, green line is that the model is reducing the weights to reduce complexity. So basically the model learns to balance those different dimensions to achieve better accuracy efficiency trade-off. 
And similarly, on the X3D bandform, we also form the uh, individually tuned networks. And here is the result on the, uh, with, uh, in comparison with the state the art radio models. So compared to the smallest X3D, we have an improvement of uh, 2.6. And compared to the best performed TSM, we reduce the complexity by uh, 17.5 times. So that's the first method. So we propose adaptive networks for uh, image and radio understanding. And in the second work, we propose a new realization method to improve the robustness and generalization ability of representation learning. And this work is accepted to new roles. Uh, so the idea of this work is actually inspired from the results of NeutralNet. So in NeutralNet, our objective is to train adaptive networks by balancing between network weights and input resolution. But we find that the performance of the full network is also improved. So in, this inspired us to think that can we leverage the subnetworks and the regularization method to improve the representation learning of the full network. And this leads to the key idea here. So the, the idea is that uh, when we do some random transformations to the input, uh, for example, a random rotation, a random scale, a random core, or even more complicated random data augmentation. Uh, when we do those uh, random transformations to the input, we hope that the network and the sub networks to make consistent predictions given those randomly transformed images. So in this way, we can say that the network learned well generalized representations. And then following this idea, the training framework is actually pretty similar to neutral net. So here, this is the training process of a regular full network. So we train using cross central loss. And for our method, we first do random transformations to the image. And here we do random rotation, random scale, and other random data computation. And then we sample some networks from the uh, full network. And here we sample some networks by network weights and also network depths. So that is the number of layers. And then we fit the uh, differently transformed images to different subnetworks. And because we want the subnetwork to make consistent predictions with the full network, so we will close their predictions by the KL divergence loss. And then the, all the networks are trained together and the total loss is the full network loss plus the subnetwork loss. So basically from this figure, we can see uh, compared to the normal training process, our training largely increased the learning difficulties of the model. So we want the model to be to make consistent predictions given uh, randomly given differently transformed images. And also we want the model to make consistent predictions using all the weights or part of the weights. So this largely increases the learning difficulties and help the model to learn robust and generalized representations. And here we also show the loss landscape of the model trained by the normal training process and our method. So here the loss landscape is generated by perturbing the weights along the directions of the top two eigen uh, top two eigen vectors of the H matrix. So basically, those directions are the directions where the loss changes most. And from this figure, we can see our model. The model trained by ours has a much flattened loss landscape compared to the normal uh, network. And this means that when we perturb the weights, our model, the loss uh, doesn't change much in our model. And this makes sense because in our training process, we are perturbing the model weights by sampling some networks. And we want the some network to make consistent predictions. So in our method, uh, we can ensure that the model has a flattened loss landscape. And the flat and loss landscape indicates that the model has a better generalization ability. And that's the method. And here is the results on ImageNet. So we first compare our method with say the R data augmentation and regularization method. And we can say our method outperforms all the previous works. And also our method can be combined with the uh, data augmentation method. And here, when we combine with some mix, we can see the performance is further improved 
and even outperform the state of the art bank of the uh, bank of tricks method. So bank of tricks is basically an integration of all the training tricks in the network. But so this performance is on the original network or all three networks combined? Mm. The networks they share parameters. So, so this is the full network performance. Well, the first the top one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but they, they actually share parameters. So, so the, the sum network is just like part of it. So the same parameter, all three networks have same parameters. Mm -hmm, yeah. But you are just reducing the number of channels or something? Yeah, yeah, number of channels. And so number of parameters doesn't increase. Oh, uh, no, yeah, yeah, because they share parameters. Yeah, we, yeah, we can also say here uh, our uh, flows and parameters didn't increase. The, the, the structure is, is basically the same as the baseline network. And here we show the performance on C100 on different network structures. And similarly, we outperform the uh, other method in different model structures. So essentially, you just have one network, but the way you compute the losses, there are three different ways. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and here we show the transfer learning performance on cocoa detection and instant segmentation. So the first thing we can say here is that although mix up and cut mix, they achieve large improvements on the image net transmutation, but this improvement doesn't transfer to the cocoa detection and instant segmentation. It actually sometimes it hurts the performance on the downstream task. But for our model, we, for our method, we not only uh, not only improve the internet application, but the model, the performance also transfer to the cocoa detection and segmentation. So this means our model is at uh, learned more generalized representation. And here, we, our method can be directly applied to the detection framework, and this can further improve the performance on detection and segmentation. Uh, so besides the good performance, we also evaluate the robustness of our method. So here we evaluate the robustness to uh, ImageNet C denoder. So ImageNet C is created by introducing a total of 75 common major fractions to the ImageNet data set. And from this table, we can see our method uh, outperforms all the other methods in most of the corruptions. And, and the overall, the mean corruption error is much lower than the other method. So this means our method is more robust to image corruptions. And here we also show the robustness to adversarial attack. And similarly, our, our model has a better robustness to adversarial attack compared to the other method. So do you have insight? Why is it? Because you're not doing anything specific for adversarial attack. Why is it robust? What's the reason? Oh, this is like in our training process. We are, like we discussed, we are sampling. First for the input, we are doing like random transformations. So, but for the regular training, so basically you are always feeling like, so we can see you are always training on this image, but we like doing random trans transformation and we see like more, like more diverse like inputs and in different uh, conditions. But the uh, is used regularly, right? Any any method will use or will use augmentation. Uh, sir? Augmentation is used widely, right? Mm -hmm. Any training, you always use augmentation to increase number of samples. Uh, oh. Uh, uh, yeah, Andrew, I'm not quite sure. So you, you mean that the augmentation is the same? Yeah, but I mean, augmentation is widely used, right? Yeah. So yeah. whenever you want to train a network, you always use augmentation. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think one thing is that uh, here we are, the, the augmentation is like much more diverse in our mm -hmm. in our process. So in, so in our process, in one training iteration where we incorporate like multiple different transformations and augmentations. And another is that we're also doing the perturbation on the models. So we are sampling the sub networks, so reducing the weights and reduce the uh, depths. And this also ensures the model you know, to be- I mean, Due to probably these different losses you have. See the one loss in full, other loss, second network and third network. Somehow that's making a difference, I think. Right, what do you think, Jay? 
So, so I think uh, theoretically we can reason that from the lost landscape, right? So for the adversarial attack, because you are doing the perturbation from input, right? So mm -hmm. you want you don't want your network to change a lot when you have a small perturbation to the input. So that reflects by the you know the lost landscape. So since we have a smoother loss landscape that provides some robustness to this kind of perturbation like adversarial attack. Yeah, I understand. But what I'm saying, why is this smooth? Because of what? The, the smooth landscape is because of three networks you have. Yeah, because um, I don't believe that's due to advertisement. Advertisement is used by used, right? Yeah. So there's nothing new. Everybody use advertisement. Yeah, I think the lot landscape is as we discussed. So we during training we're preserving the model ways yeah, by okay. sampling the yeah. There's something going on there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, this is the so yeah, this is robust to the adversary attack. And basically that's the second work. So we propose a new method to uh, in, improve the generalization ability and robustness of the conditioner. And in the third work, we propose a new method to adapt uh, image foundation model for efficient video understanding. And this work has been accepted to XLR. So, uh, so we've seen that VIT structure has achieved uh, great success in computer vision. And based on VIT, uh, there are many Different image foundation models being proposed, uh, such as Flip and Flores. But the, the, the limitation that those foundation models are also very large, like Flip has more than 300 million parameters, and Flores has more than 600 million parameters. So, in video action recognition, the, com the common learning paradigm to build a video model is to bootstrap from a pre trained image model. So, like like one, one way is to like the top one, we add some new temporal modules to the image model. Like the VIT, we add some new uh, temporal encoders after the spatial transformer encoder. Or in transformer, we add new temporal self attention to the VIT block. And the second way is that we directly extend the 2D model into 3D model. Like we just mean, we extend the 2D self attention into 3D self attention to handle the uh, temporal dynamics. Then after we get those video models, we fully tune them on our target uh, downstream video data. But the problem is that uh, if we want to bootstrap from those image foundation models, then the video model will be very large. And then fully tuning on the video data is going to take a lot of training costs. And the second problem is contextual forgetting. That is when we fully tune the pre trained model on downstream data, we may lose some good properties in the pre trained model, especially given that the pre trained model, the, the image model has been pre trained on large scale data. So, to solve those problems, there have been an area called um, parameter efficient fine tuning being proposed. And the key idea of parameter efficient fine tuning is basically we want, we, we, during training, we keep the pre trained model fixed and we add some new uh, parameters to tune the feature on downstream tasks. So like here, we add some new prompts into the VIT, uh, into the VIT model, and we keep the pre-trained layers fake, and we only tune the new prompts to tune the feature on downstream paths. And also like here, we add a we can add a lightweight adapter into the VIT floor, and we only tune we only tune the adapter and keep the other layer space. But in previous works, all the previous work they are just doing the same modality adaptation. And here they are adapting a image foundation model to solve image tasks and a adapting a language model to solve language tasks. But here in this work, we are doing cross modality adaptation. And here we are adapting a pre trained image model to solve a uh, video task. Now, our overall idea is to follow the most common video modeling strategy. And is to split the video model into spatial model and temporal model. Then for spatial modeling, we simply add a lightweight, uh, lightweight adapter into the pre-trained VEG block. And then during training, we only update the adapter when we keep other layers space. 
And because the red block has been pre-trained on large scale image data, so this simple efficient fine tuning should be able to learn good spatial information from videos. And then the challenge is how to add uh, temporal model. So in previous works, the common strategy is to add new temporal layers and then train those uh, new parameters uh, from scratch. But this will be very inefficient. So in our method, we propose a simple strategy. That is, we directly reuse the image pre-trained separate engineer, but we apply it to the temporal dimension of the video inputs. So in this way, we ensure the network to learn the uh, relationships across different input frames. <coughs> and similarly, we add a lightweight adapter to tune the temporal information. So in this way, we add temporal modeling into the model, but we didn't add any new model parameters except this lightweight adapter. So here, the, uh, the self-attention for spatial and temporal, they share parameters. And finally, we add another damper at the end of the red block to tune the spatial and temporal uh, information jointed for better performance. So this is the overall method. And here we give a step-by-step -step analysis to show how our method uh, gradually adapt a image, uh, frozen image model into a video model. And here, we first introduce three baselines. The first baseline is a frozen image only baseline. That is, we only tune the final classification head on the video data. And we can see the tunable parameters is very few, but the performance is also very low. And then the second baseline is we do the full fine tuning on the uh, image model on video data. And we can see the tunable parameters is largely increased, and the performance is also improved. And the third baseline is a full fine tuned video model. So here we use transformer. So basically, it adds new uh, temporal self attention layer into the red block and train the whole model uh, end to end on the video data. So we can see the model parameters is largely increased, but the performance is also largely increased. Then our objective in this work is to adapt this frozen uh, image model to be competitive with this full fine tuned video model. Then in the first step, we add the spatial adaptation. And we can see the model has the, achieved a comparable performance with the full by tuned image model. And this means that our spatial adaptation helps the model to learn good spatial information from video. But we only introduce a few tunable parameters. And second, we add the temporal adaptation. And we can see the performance is again largely improved. And it's even it even outperforms the uh, full fine tuned video model. So this means that the temporal adaptation helps the model to learn good temporal information from videos. But again, we are just and a few a few tunable model parameters. And finally, we add the joint adaptation, and this can again improve the performance. So basically, this table shows how our method gradually adapts a frozen image model to be to a video model. And this is on the uh, ImageNet pre-trained image model. And when we switch to a flip pre-trained model, the performance can uh, again be improved. And this means that our method can easily benefit from stronger image foundation model. And in the future, if there are new stronger image foundation models being proposed, and we, we can easily apply our methods to get uh, new video foundation models. So when you say ImageNet pre-trained, but they don't have, do they have pairs, image and text? Because the clip is image pairs, right? The train on the image pairs. Oh, you mean the image net? Yeah, what is? What oh, is for, for the image net, it's, no, no, it's not a clip pre train, it's just the uh, regular supervised pre train on image net. And how about the text? Uh, you, you don't use a text recorder? Uh, no, no, because this is not a clear model. It's just the okay, model. Just get a major Yes. Yeah. And you adapt to the video. Yeah. But this one is a clear part. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This one is we're using the okay. image encoding and adapt it. Okay. But, but you started, say, you want to adapt the, the clip kind of model. But this is just experiment. But the main thing you want to oh. adapt a clip. Uh, it's not 
uh, we're not trying to adapt we but actually we're trying to so adapt a image model. Image model. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, so that's the uh, method. And here is the result on um, that is 400. So basically, we can say our method achieved the best performance compared to the previous uh, full fine tuning video model. And we can see we are tuning a much uh, smaller number of tunable parameters compared to the uh, video model. And here, similarly, on Kinetic 700 and 1948, we achieved comparable or better performance than the uh, safety art video model. But there are also some limitations with this method. So here we show the result of something something v2. So something something v2 is a temporal heavy data set. That is, it contains some action class that only have very minor difference. For example, uh, pushing something from left to right or pushing something from right to left. So to distinguish those actions, the model has to capture really strong temporal information. And we can see, on this data set, our model still has some gap with the uh, state of the art video models. And, and we think the reasons are twofold. One is that uh, our model is only pre trained on image data. But for those video models, they are not only pre trained on video data, uh, on image data, but, but also on video data. So we already use some temporal information at the pre training stage. <laughs> and second, so our strategy of simply reusing the spatial self-attention layer for temporal modeling may not be strong enough to fully capture the complicated temporal information in, in such videos. So we may, to further improve the performance, we may still need to enhance the uh, temporal modeling in our method. And here we also do a per-class analysis to further demonstrate this problem. So here, this figure is the uh, performance difference of our method and the full fine tuned video model. And the green one is basically the action classes where our model outperforms a uh, full fine tuned video model. And the blue one is the uh, action classes where our method underperforms full fine tuned video model. So if we check the blue one, we can see those are many of the action classes that have, have very minor difference, like pushing something from left to right and pulling something from left to right and pulling something from right to left. So to distinguish those actions, uh, the model has to be really strong in temporal modeling. And our method may still need to be enhanced in this sense. So, uh, and that's the uh, analysis. And here is the results. We applied it to different model structures. And here we apply it to VIP structure and the swing transformer. And we can see on both structures, we achieve comparable performance with the uh, corresponding video models. And also our method can largely save the uh, training cost of video models. And here we can see compared to video swing, we save the memory by 50% and the training time by uh, 40, 42%. So this is on connected, what, what's the data set? Uh, uh, you mean this? Yeah, it's on kinetics 400. And this is uh, our method also has the benefits of data efficiency. That is, when the label of training data is very low, our method has the even larger improvements over the full factor tracing. Yeah, this is also a kinetic component. Uh, yeah, basically, yeah, that's the third word. So, to su uh, in summary, in this dissertation, we propose to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of representation learning from the three perspective. So first we propose adaptive networks where one network can meet re dynamic resource budgets to improve the efficiency. And then we propose a new regularization method to, in to improve the robustness and generalization ability of representations. And finally we propose a new method to adapt image foundation models to achieve efficient video understanding. Uh, and for future works, uh, one direction is that we can explore the potential of those of the above mentioned works in the unsupervised setting. And currently in this dissertation, all the works are studied in the supervised setting, but we can also explore their potentials in the unsupervised, sorry, uh, unsupervised setting. And another direction is that we can further explore the potential of the third work and to apply it to expand foundation models to more tasks and modalities. 
So for example, we can apply it to image generative model and expand, expand image generative model to video generative model. And also we can apply it to uh, reading language, uh, reading language model to include uh, more modalities and to achieve a multi-modality interactive reality. So that's all for my presentation. And here is the selected list of my publications. Uh, so my work has uh, received a uh, total of 831 uh, citations with an H index of 40, of 40. And my paper has uh, selected as the CHR best paper finalist and ECCV oral presentation. Uh, yeah, that's all for my presentation.